Hello everyone, this is your host Michelle and you're listening to the Mindful Podcast, the show that aims to break the stigma associated with mental health. Today we will be talking about first responders, post-traumatic stress, and ways to cope with it with Billy Sinkay, Sergeant in Recovery. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Mindful Podcast. Today we have Billy Sinke. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Sergeant in Recovery. That is How are I. you today? I'm actually doing fantastic. How are you? Welcome to Florida. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, I've got to admit, the weather's a little bit better here than it is back home. Where West are you Chicago. from again? Chicago. Chicago. Yeah, it, was, uh, it was about 64 degrees when I left. Oh my God. Well, that's not bad. Florida's great. Yes. (laughs) All right. Can you tell us or tell the audience a little bit about yourself, your background personally and professionally? Sure. Uh, So I was originally born and raised just outside of Chicago in a a suburb called Cicero, Illinois, which is kind of weird. It's surrounded on three sides by Chicago. So basically sunk on the west side (laughs) of Chicago. Uh, Played basketball in high school a couple of years of junior college till an in- injury ended my career and then uh, later on in life back in uh, 2007 i actually uh was hired as a police officer and i served 13 years with a suburban department just outside of chicago ended my career as a sergeant oh wow what made you become a cop to be honest uh, i had always been interested in helping and serving people uh, it sounds like the cliche answer you know, to serve and protect but uh grew up in a very close family my mom and dad amazing people a brother uh my mom and dad were really hard-working people and our house had actually been burglarized a couple of times and it frustrated me and, and i thought to myself that you know maybe that i can make a difference out there and maybe help people that were like my parents like my family and uh, also i'm a people person i just love people so yeah it gave me an opportunity to meet a lot of amazing and interesting people on believe it or not, on both sides of the fences. So. Yeah, no, I believe it. And when you were doing that career, when you were being a police, what are some of the pros and cons or the good times or bad times that you got to experience in that career? Pros. Pros would be people, uh, not just the people I dealt with in the community, but the, all the officers that I served with. Uh, a lot of the uh, law enforcement officers that I met along the way throughout my 13-year career that were in sister jurisdictions that we worked closely with officers I met in training uh, people I served under uh, that was probably the best part of the job um, connecting with the community mm-hmm. and anything that had to do with being around the kids because it's yeah it was a really rewarding feeling when you would meet a little kid who would look up and like with a big smile <laughs> on their face yeah you know, so I uh would usually drag them out to the squad car, let them play with the lights and stuff. Nice. Break get in trouble for that. (laughs) Community relations is everything when it comes to the police. Perfect. And some of the negatives. Negatives. Uh, Probably resorts back to, uh, to kids. Anything, anything that was violent or abusive towards children, any type of calls that you went on that, that involved violence towards children and women, uh, domestic situations, um, were the probably the hardest part of the job. Um, yeah, I can only difficult. imagine. Very, very difficult, especially when you're a father, uh, yeah. father and a husband, and then you, you walk into a scene where where someone has been violently injured, you know, due to a domestic situation. It's usually sad, especially when it's little kids. How were you able to deal with those situations back in the day? It wasn't easy. Uh, Did you deal with them at all? Probably not. You know, we, as police officers, unfortunately, we have a habit of just stuffing things down deep inside. Uh, We're told on a daily basis that, you know, we're the police and we're the ones who solve the problems, not the ones who have the problems. And uh, we have to, we're we're in a situation where we're basically forced to be courageous and brave all the time. Uh, I can't tell you how many times uh, you show up on a call that you've never been on before, something unique, some type of situation. And you really got to be on the fly because some of these situations involve public safety, personal safety. So you have to be able to think on your feet. Most of the time, um, if I got around my family, um, it helped. But I started to realize at times that, you know, some of that frustration that I was dealing with on the job was transferring over into my family life. Become quite irritable uh, after a long shift and, and dealing with basically negativity for eight hours 
on a shift, you come home, uh, your family problems don't stop. The stresses of yeah. being at home, they don't end. So it's, it's just like almost one continuing cycle of just stress. Not that all moments with family yeah. are stress, but you know what I mean. Yeah. No, especially with the line of duty that you do. You sure. see so many things and then you come home. Anything yeah. could be a trigger. Well, and also everything other than life and death almost becomes trivial. Uh, for example, like, you know, if you're you're at home with your spouse and, you know, to you after you work 12 or 16 hours and you take your socks off and leave them on the floor for five minutes while you're getting ready to go take a shower or whatever. And, you know, your spouse may come in and say, hey, why did you leave your socks on the floor? You're like, seriously, this yeah. is what you're concerned about. But she, like, do you know what I went through? Yeah, <laughs> she doesn't live in that world. So you can't you can't assume she understands what it's like. So you have to understand that that other things are serious and important to other people, too. It's not just what you think is important. Yeah. Um, it, police officers can be jaded and desensitized to, uh, to other people's needs. Yeah. Now, you were diagnosed with PTS. Yes. Correct? Yeah. It's, it's, this is kind of a story that leads into it. I didn't really know mm -hmm. uh, until uh, back in May of 2020, uh, I had an unfortunate incident in my personal life which led to ramifications for my career. I was, uh, I went on a fishing trip by myself. My, my, my wife, who was at the time my fiance, uh, convinced me to go fish by myself. She said, you know, you're always fishing with me and the kids and you never get a break. And you know, why don't you just mm -hmm. go and fish by yourself? And I was hesitant. I felt, I, I had like a weird feeling inside me. I, I really didn't want to go alone. I kept telling her, just come with me. Just come, no, you deserve it, you deserve it. Like, okay. okay. Um, Prior to that, I had issues with alcohol pretty much my whole life. Uh, probably about 30 years of my life, I was a binge drinking alcoholic, uh, meaning that I wasn't an everyday drinker. I never felt a need. I wasn't an addict. I was an yeah. abuser. So uh, I didn't really think I had a problem because I drank two or three times a month or maybe more, a little, few, few times more, but I always drank to the point of intoxication. I always okay. drank to the point of some, most of the time, blackout towards the end. Um, but I had realized I had issues with some other incidents that happened in my personal life, and I decided to give it up. So I had been sober for approximately, give or take, three and a half years with one hiccup in the middle. At that time, I was probably seven, eight months sober, and uh, drinking never even crossed my mind that day. I just was going to go fish, but it was cold outside, and I, I made a trip down to central Illinois and was going to one of my favorite lakes. And when I walked in to go buy some bait, Mm -hmm. uh, I passed the liquor cabinet as I was walking by, and I just looked up in the corner. And I go, huh? Looked at a sign above it, it said liquor sales start at seven a.m. And I literally looked at my watch; it was six fifty-nine. Oh my god! And I said, "Well, that's meant to be, right? That's a sign. <laughs> that's a sign from the Lord." It's happy hour yeah, somewhere. So, uh, so I grabbed the bottle off the shelf, grabbed my worms, went down to the fishing hole, and then once I once I got down to the fishing location, I started mixing whiskey and coffee, and I drank basically a fifth of whiskey in about an hour. And uh, once that happened, I started to get intoxicated and I was just threw my lines in the water and said, I'm going to be out here all day anyway. No one's going to know. I'll just get home. I'll be sober. Yeah. And uh, out of nowhere, I was fishing from the shore. I had a couple of catfish lines out there. Any fisherman out there will understand my frustration and why, why what happened happened. <laughs> the boater started coming into the cove where I'd climbed in and... I said, oh, no, he's coming right for my lines. He's coming for my lines. No, he's not going to. Oh, yeah, there he is. And he rolled right over my lines. And I had words with him. I just, not in a mean way. I just looked at yeah. him. I said, dude, you got the whole lake. What are you doing? Yeah. And then he w spoke back to me very unkindly and said, you know, it's not my effing problem. You can't afford a boat. So I want you to kind of place us. We're, we're May 2020, right? It's May 9th, 2020. And it's COVID time. It's right at the, the, the beginning of COVID-19. Yeah. I'm working the street. I'm concerned about bringing this virus home to my family, bringing it you know, home to my elderly parents. Uh, concerned I'm going to kill my whole family with this. So it was a stressful time, not to mention the financial aspect of it. My family was having difficulties financially. My, my wife, who was my fiance, wasn't able to work. You know, her, I was helping her with the kids, helping her family, helping my family. We were just, it was, but I was actually grateful to do it. Grateful. So where the where he struck the nerve was is accusing me of not being able to afford a boat. But in my head, I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I'll, I don't have a boat because all I do is help my family. Yeah. So who, who do you think you are? I had just enough reserve left in the tank. I just bit my tongue and said, you know what? He's not worth it. 
until the boat started trailing and his buddy threw a bottle at me, beer bottle at me, from the boat. It kind of whizzed past me. Didn't hit me. Bad aim. <laughs> and uh, that set me off. Yeah. So at that point in time, I uh, I said, well, now I have to go have a conversation. I'm not only a police officer, but I'm a type A personality, and I defend myself. Yeah. Oops. Sorry about that. That's okay. So uh, I grabbed my fishing gear, went up to the bridge, put my stuff in the back of the truck, and then uh, headed over to the boat ramp where I thought their boat was going. And when I got there, they weren't there. So now you've got an angry human being, right, without closure, drunk, yeah. and I'm, I'm in the red zone, and I'm, I'm starting, my, my tunnel vision is starting to close in. And uh, I don't know what possessed me because in my lifetime, I was never someone who damaged property or hurt anybody. Uh, I had a knife in my pocket. I pulled it out and I popped the tire on a truck that was next to me that had a boat trailer that had no boat. So um, very uncharacteristic of who I was. And to give you yeah. an idea of where I was uh, as far as my tolerance for liquor, I was I was extremely drunk. Never would have done anything like that in my sober life. I did everything I could to help people when I was sober. Uh, then let's talk about the second bad decision is when I kind of peeked back and went, hmm, there's three other cars there. One of them's got to be his. Hit Randomly. A tire, hit a tire in every car. Because oh, I wow. thought, process of elimination, I got him. <laughs> I got him. Oh, my God. Yeah, so at that point, uh, I was unaware that there was someone who observed this going on. And, and uh, I'm pretty sure they took pictures of me, my license plate. You know, if at the very least, had communicated it with the sheriff's yeah. department. And then when I dr- rationally drove back to the hill to go back fishing, because I thought, hey, you know, I drove three hours to get here. I'm fishing. No one's mm-hmm. stopping me. Once again, alcohol. It takes away, erases that line yeah. between the rational and the irrational. Went back up to the hill, and by the time I got up there, I looked down the road, and I saw red and blue lights coming down the road. They are already so going to get you. They were coming to get me. And uh, I looked up in the sky. I, it's one of the clearest memories I have from that day. Not many of them are very clear, but I looked up in the sky, and I said, ah, I guess it's over. That was my response. So you were, like, almost expecting it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I knew there was no way I was getting out of this one. Yeah, there was was just no way. And honestly, uh, uh, I didn't deserve to get out of it. Um, I assume 100% responsibility for the mistakes I made that day. Uh, In order for me to fix my life, I had to take responsibility. Okay. So when the deputy arrived and he started to talk to me, uh, being the fantastic and, and, and creative criminal that I am, he walked up and he said, hey, how are you today, sir? And I looked at him, I go, I did it. I did it. You know, I you literally, could, I, I yeah, even, you not couldn't even, even hide it. I was so guilt stricken that I, I, I couldn't even lie. I, I, there's no way. I just said, man, it was me. He said, what was what was you? And I said, I'm the one who popped all those tires. And he went, oh, and he kind of bladed himself almost in a defensive posture. Yeah. And I said, I go, dude, I'm a cop. He said, you're a cop? I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah, my I know God. I, I said, I know I did a terrible thing. I said, listen, I just want to pay for everything all the damage i want to pay for everything i said i realize I'm, I'm not trying to buy my way out of trouble but i feel terrible about what i did and he says well that's not you know it's not my jurisdiction and i'm like oh god oh no who is it he tells me you know it's the conservation police and and i thought okay so now i'm gonna have to deal with another police officer and uh, that gentleman rolled up i basically told him what happened and then and then uh he started going into like a DUI investigation. He's like, well, did you drive down to the boat ramp? And because I wasn't thinking. I was like, yeah, yeah. I drove. I'm like, oh, oh no. you just kept digging I said, dude, it. I said, I got four counts of criminal damage coming. And you're going to give me a DUI too? He said, well, I'm going to have you take some tests. I said, no, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not taking any tests. Because yeah. I knew, I knew the Yeah, of course. And so uh, at that time, you know, I spun around. He put me in cuffs, took me into custody and uh, walked me over to the police vehicle. And, you know, later on, I... I I had copies of the police report, so I, I went in and I I read the report. And from the short walk, from the time I was placed in a handcuffs to the time I was placed in the vehicle, uh, I believe it was 42 times I said the words, my life is over. My life is over. And I didn't say I'm going to get fired. I didn't say uh, yeah. you know, I'm in trouble. I said my life is over. And that's that comes along with the territory in certain jobs, right? Being a police officer, one of the most dangerous things that you can do is replace your personal human identity with your career. It's the most dangerous thing you can do. You might ask why. Well, first of all, you're never going to wear that uniform forever. It's going, that day is going to end. You're either going to retire, uh, you're going to leave voluntarily, you're going to get basically terminated. I mean, I'll finish the story. I didn't actually get terminated. I was given the option, option to resign. 
yeah. um, or maybe an injury might end your career. So it's really dangerous for anybody in any career to assume the identity of that career because yeah. it's not forever, ever. It's not. And then you'll place all your focus on that career and then you start to neglect your human side. So you, you put all this focus into being a cop, right? Every cop is trained to shoot and trained to handle certain situations and really good at it. But you ask the question, like, do you get enough sleep? Do you yeah. Eat right. Are you good to your family? You spend time with your family. Are you what so- are your hobbies besides right. being a cop? What are my hobbies? <laughs> was <I'm> fishing. <laughs> <laughs> it was fishing. No, I still, fa- I still, no, I still fish. I still fish. But, uh, Going back to the story, so so once I was transported to the to the sheriff's department, uh, that's when the horror kind of kicked in. I was already starting to enter crisis mode. I was in a bad place. I was crying, uh, you know, begging the guy to loosen my cuffs. That was that was not a good thing. But um, and once I got into the cell, I started having um, basically all the signs and symptoms of a heart attack, which I would find out later were just a, a full blown panic, like a panic attack. Yeah, chest pain, shortness of breath. Um, sweat, cold sweats, uh, just terrified. So I'm screaming for help, screaming for help, screaming for help. And, you know, sometimes officers, when they hear somebody screaming, they just think he's drunk. He's, yeah. just, he's just drunk. He'll dry out. He'll be okay. Yeah. But I was really in fear for my, my life at that point because I had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes not long before that. And I thought, oh, boy, this is it, the big one. So I screamed for help. Nobody came. And then, so I was trying to get their attention to the camera and I was waving and, and still they didn't come right away. I, to this day, I don't know what the time frame was. Like it felt like six hours. <coughs> Sorry. That's okay. I don't know what the time frame was. It felt like it was like six hours, but it could have been six minutes for all I know, but they just weren't coming fast enough. So uh, I started getting, the tunnel started getting smaller with my tunnel vision and I couldn't really think. I just knew I needed to go to the hospital. I needed to get out of that jail cell. I'm yeah. a cop, you know. I just got arrested with a sergeant's badge in my back. Yeah, I'm sure you were in shock at that oh, point. Shame, guilt, shock, name it. Probably like, coming back to yourself yes. after all the alcohol. Oh no, I was getting I was actually getting drunker because it was I was getting worse. Oh, I was wow. thinking less rational. Okay. So uh in an attempt to go to the hospital, I falsely pretended like I was trying to hurt myself. I took my shirt off, I wrapped it around my neck, and I started trying to like choke myself in front of the camera, wrenching yeah. on the shirt in front of the camera, like pointing, almost pointing at myself. It's like, somebody comes to the, to the cell. Didn't come fast enough. Like, what is going on? So I, uh, at that point, last, my last ditch effort was I crawled on the floor in between the toilet and the wall because I thought that if they lost visual of me on camera, then I knew yeah. they were coming. Like, Where is he? Yeah. And they did. And they basically, you know, I don't want to call it like an extraction team or anything like that. I don't want to get too dramatic. But uh, they did drag me out of the cell by the back of my pants. And they put me in a restraint chair and tied me down. Started yelling at me. You know, what are you doing? What do you want to die? What's what's your problem? You know, there's like four or five deputies and a sergeant. and And I can remember saying, well, if you stop yelling at me, you stop screaming at me, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what's going on. And then the sergeant said to me, he's like, what do you want to die? Is that what you want? Do you want to die? And I got angry. And I said, is that what I got to do to go to the hospital? Then, yeah. You know, I used some bad words and said, I want to die. Take me to the effing hospital. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that that was interesting because we know where that leads. Yep. So I went to the ER. I dried out. And then uh, I was given an option to either voluntarily or involuntarily be committed to a mental health. um, Uh, Yeah, psychiatric psychiatric unit. unit. Like Baker acted. Basically. Yeah, basically. Well, if I had said no, I would have been Voluntary. Right. Voluntary. So, um, so I said, and so in my head, because I was still under the effects of the alcohol, I'm like, well, yeah, I'll just voluntarily check myself and that'll save my job. <laughs> yeah, didn't work that way. So uh, so I spent 72 hours in a psych unit in a small hospital. Um, I'll tell you, I don't recommend it. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the most terrifying things I've ever been through in my whole life. I was terrified. Just... You can send me to a bar fight. You can send me to a domestic. You can send me to shots fired. I don't care. Send. Me, I never go back to that psyche. I, yeah. That that could have been the motivation alone for me to straighten out my life, but I needed more. I needed I needed help. And uh, at that point, I had been in constant communication with my wife, who was my like I said, my fiance at the time, just begging her, um, and she fought with everybody. 
man. She's, you don't mess yeah. with, you don't mess with her, man, especially when it comes to protecting me. Man. She was, nice. she was on it. And uh, she, I, I could actually, I remember one time she was talking to the psychiatrist who was there screaming at him over the phone and I could hear it through the glass. And I'm like, oh my God, that's my wife. <laughs> um, pretty cool though to know I had her on my side. Yeah. And so uh, she had actually gotten a hold of people with my police department who got in touch with the union, who then in turn got me uh, agreed. They had got an agreement with the psychiatrist where they would release me in 72 hours if I went directly to a treatment center for help with my alcoholism. Okay. Um, and man, they could have told me I was going to Siberia. I'd have been like, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, I didn't man. care. I just needed to get out of there. I yeah. was awake for 72 hours straight. I didn't sleep not one minute. I didn't eat one piece of food and I walked the hallways as long as they would let me. And they got to know me over those three days. They knew I wasn't going to be a problem. I wasn't dangerous. Yeah. But I just told them, like, I can't be in that room. I can't be around these people. Um, I had to actually had a, a female try to bite me. We jumped over a table in a group, tried to bite me. It was crazy stuff. Yeah. You know, it's just, uh, she was sick. I don't I, I get it. Yeah. You know, but I didn't want to You be just there. didn't belong there. No, didn't belong there. Uh, was released from there. And then what ended up happening was I went to a, uh, a first responder treatment program out in Florida where I was able to get help for both the alcohol substance abuse. And then this is where it comes in where you would ask, man, I'm going to break that glass. Sorry about that glass. <laughs> Don't break uh, your watch. <laughs> yeah. um, that was where um, I was evaluated and diagnosed with the PTSD. PTS, PTSI, whatever we call it these days. You know, yeah. I know it can be a disorder, it can be an injury, and then you know it could just be signs and symptoms of the actual post-traumatic stress. But um, I had showed some, I exuded signs of not just acute from what I'd gone through through the arrest, but I had signs of, of cumulative that had occurred probably over the year, you know, 13 years of my career. Uh, had gone through divorce in 2011, um, very close to my kids. It was really tough on me to not live full time with my children. That's by mm -hmm. far bar none. The worst traumatic incident of my life yeah. was telling my children that daddy has to go live somewhere else. That was out, out, out any, of everything, anything I've been through. I'd be arrested mm -hmm. five, 10 times the same exact way before I would go back to do that again. That's just not, that's not for anybody. Uh, when you're close yeah. and I love my girls, you know, we're still close to this day and I got, that's great. Two, through my marriage, I got another two yeah. kids. So, um, but yeah, yeah, it was the diagnosed with PTSD. So you had to hit rock bottom oh, almost yeah. to realize. Oh yeah. That for me, for me, yeah, of course. Because because I, I was the epitome of the guy who said I can handle this on my own. Okay. And I had seen signs and symptoms earlier on in my life. I had, had incidents in my life where anyone else would have been like, "Yeah, it's time to go get help." And I didn't. I, I got a little bit of help, but I did it. I went to go see a behavioral therapist for a little while. Okay. And uh, throughout the course of seeing her, uh, she had convinced me to go to AA. She's like, drinking is a problem for you. I did most of it for the appearance that I was getting the help. That's what I did it for. I was trying to save my job, you know, trying to save face with the people I love. Never really thought I needed it. Because when you're... Binge drinking is a lot different than being an, an everyday alcoholic or an addict, someone who's addicted to alcohol. Binge drinking is, I love the taste of alcohol. I have no shutoff valve. And when I do it, I'm going to do it right. So, it's, and, you know, and, and obviously, you know, maybe subconsciously, I had been self-medicating for years. I mean, I knew there were times when I was dealing with the heartache of my divorce and, or, or, or you know, missing my kids where I drank myself to sleep, no doubt, or dealt with certain things on calls where... Yeah, I, I, if I knew I wasn't going to have my kids, my kids had no idea I drank. Yeah. My children had never seen me drink. And when I went to rehab and my family was at my house waiting for me to go to rehab, um, my kids were like, what are you going for help for, Dad? They don't even I said, know. I said, alcohol. They're like, you don't drink. Oh, wow. L literally. So like, you were hiding it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. A master, master craftsman when it comes to, to hiding. And, and that's that's part of the big lie, too. Like. Being an addict or being somebody who abuses substances, you're always lying. Always. You know, you're not you're not lying in a sense of all the other areas of your life, but when it comes to your your uh, your issue, you're lying about it constantly. Did you drink today? No, 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 no. How much did you have to drink? I had two beers. Yeah. It's all a lie. And you get into a habit of lying about the problem, about the issue. I wasn't a liar any in any other capacity of my life. Everywhere else I was honest, but when it came to that, that was my little that was my little cave. You know, that's where I, I lied the most.
was when it came to my drinking. Do you feel like you were also lying to yourself? Oh, 100%. And maybe that's why it was easier to lie to other people? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's like the biggest crime on earth. How do you lie to yourself? You know, that's a lack of integrity. You have to be honest with yourself. And that's why I'm going back to the 100% responsibility. You know, I, I When I came home from treatment, I was bitter because my department, well, let me rewind. Five days into my treatment, my department uh, was seeking to terminate my employment. I was on the job for 13 years. I had one verbal reprimand in my in my file uh, for ironically blowing two tires on a squad car while I was driving, right? <laughs> Why does everything in my life involve a fucking tire? <laughs> so uh, I had only one verbal reprimand. It wasn't actually official discipline. It had, it had burned out several years before. Like the, the, the paperwork's only good for a year. And, uh, but never had been formally disciplined, never had been sued, never had been accused of misconduct, never had been late to a roll call. 13 years and five days into this journey, um, I'm being called by my rep saying they're going to terminate me. I said, dude, seriously? I'm like, I've been, the, I've been on this job 13 years. I don't even have a write-up in my file. He's like, it's the mental health stuff, buddy. You know, he's like, you went to the, the psychiatric unit. You know, he goes, I'm going to I'm gonna do what I can to fight for you. He says, but it's going to be tough. I say, okay. So the one thing that you thought was going to help you. Hurt me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, either hurt way. Hurt you. Yeah. yeah at, for what you wanted at the moment. Right. But then that just says so much about the mental health stigma. No doubt. Right? Because no if doubt. you did need it, then how many people don't reach out because they're afraid it's that just, they're going to lose their job? Yeah. Most of them. Yeah. Um, the rate of of self medication in the first responder world is much higher than anyone can imagine. Um, it's become part of the culture, you know, especially with cops. Uh, don't throw stuff at me when you see me out there, <laughs> fellow police officers. But you know, every cop knows where the morning yeah. bars are. Every cop knows where the best deals are. Every cop knows where the hookup is. When it comes to getting the best prices and being around the best people, so it's it's really deeply entwined with that career. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but I think it's the silent, you know, the the silent secret is is that it it is self medication. And cops are a unique blend. They they pack together. They pack together because they feel like no one else understands them. It's very difficult. Like when you've been on a fatal car crash and you see stuff that no one should ever have to see. It's hard to go back and talk to your family about that. And you're like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I yeah. rolled up onto this crash and this guy's, you know, this guy's scalp was hanging off and his children were screaming in the back seat. And the firemen had to come out and cut him out. They can hear the story and they can visualize it to the best of their ability. Yeah. But until you're in the mix and you smell the blood, you can't understand what it went through. You can't. You can't. So that that is a stigma in itself. Like nobody understands this. So when it comes to getting help, why am I going to go talk to some therapist who doesn't know anything about me, never walked in my shoes? Yeah. Um, I disagree with that. I, I highly disagree with that. Now, after going through the process, yes, I had first responder therapists, and yes, I had first responders involved in my treatment, but I also had civilians, and I had people who had never been addicted or had recovery issues, or I'm sorry, addiction and alcohol abuse issues. But you know, they taught us how to live right. They never made those mistakes. So you can learn from anybody. You can learn tools from everyone. That's um, but true. It's, it's a tough breed to crack, man. I'm telling you, the first responders are tough uh, because of the, the bravery clause. You know, like we have to be brave and we can't show weakness. And then let's say, for example, you do choose to get assistance. You do choose to go, go for help. Um, you're worried about how your peers are going to view you, whether or not they're going to trust you. Like, hey, you remember when he was in the, you know, remember when he was in the psych yeah, ward? Yeah, the loony. I don't want him going with me on this call. So uh, these are the things that play in your head. Um, you're a broken toy. Nobody wants to play with you. Nobody wants to be on calls with you. So, how are, What are some ways you think um, we as a society can do to try to break that stigma? Oh, wow. So uh, number one, um, as far as just breaking the stigma, it's going to be difficult. We're going to, what we need is we need more people to come forward that have been through it um, and, and to tell their, give their testimony as to how they got help and how it worked for them. Um, that's why I do what I do now. I'm working in the outreach program for Haven, for the Haven for Heroes program. I, I tell my story constantly 
people are shocked when I tell it. They're like, man, how do you get up there and tell people about this awful day and this awful experience? I said, because if I can save one life, it's worth it. One, just one. If I can save just one life, it's worth it. Um, let me have gone through the pain for you. Let me send the message yeah. that, that you need to get help while you're hanging on the edge of the hole and not when you're laying in the pit, when you're at rock bottom. It's a lot easier to reach up and grab that hand while you're on the edge than it is to try and reach up from the bottom of the hole. I had to dig myself out of the hole. Even though I had seen the signs, even though there were certain people in my life that told me I should probably do something, um, good friends, I didn't listen. And, and look what happened. I get back. Um, at, like I was telling the story about five days in, I'm, I'm learning I'm going to lose my job. So now instead of you know, wanting to focus on my treatment, right? What do I do? I implode. At that point in time, I felt like I got hit in the chest with a sledgehammer. I go back. I was actually in a first responder group. And this is, this is really important. This is really imperative for me to get on track. I went back to this group and I was sitting with uh, some other veterans and first responders and I walked in the room and I, I imploded. I was crying. My head was buried in my hands. And one of the other fellow first responders walked up. He was actually a Navy veteran. He walks up. He's like, hey, Billy. He's like, uh, you okay, man? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. He said, what's wrong? I said, I just found out I lose my job. He's like, yeah. He goes, uh, you're a nice guy, man. I'm like, thanks, man. He's like, yeah, but I'm real tired of hearing about your job. And I was like, I was crying. I was like, uh, huh? <laughs> He goes, yeah, man. He goes, are you here to save your job? Or are you here to save your, your life? He used some harsher language. <laughs> and I just looked but at him and I said, wow. I said, uh, man, he makes sense. So at that point, I actually went back to my room. I was living in an apartment with a couple other guys. And uh, I walked in my room. I closed the door. I grabbed my Bible. I said, this is, this is tough for me. This one's tough because it's this is reality i laid the bible on the bed and i opened it and i looked in the sky and said wherever i open i'm going to read I had no idea what was that and it was psalm 27 i remember reading the psalm and then getting to the end and at the end it's, it's uh be strong hold tight and wait for the lord those are the words at the end of psalm 27 not the entire paragraph i'm mm -hmm. summarizing but and i looked in the sky literally and said god i cannot do it i'm giving it to you I've heard it before. Let go. Let God, you know, yeah. give it over to a higher power. Literally that day, I looked in the sky and said, God, I'm giving my life to you. And from that day forward, I can't even tell you the amount of miracles that I've experienced in my life and the, the amount of service that I've been inspired to perform. It's now my whole life is geared towards service. That's it. Yeah. God-centered service, love, compassion, prayer, meditation. That is the key to my recovery, without a doubt. Do you think mindset is also a big contributor absolutely to your journey at absolutely. this moment you know uh being mindful is uh god probably 50 percent of the battle because we spend so much time regretting resenting and living in the past for things that we've done that we can't fix you know five minutes a year I, there, there's a guy that i love i don't have you ever heard of dr wayne dyer he's passed away in 2015 um, just an old school psychologist who wrote a bunch of books on wonderful things. And, 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 and he talked about the past. He's like five minutes ago is as changeable as 5,000 years ago. Like you have just as much impact on five minutes ago as you do 5,000 years ago. So just leave the past in the past. Move forward. So that's what mindfulness is all about. It's learning how to, to stop letting resentment and regret and guilt. Let those those emotions that weaken you it's about it's about forgetting the past just detach from it yeah have your good memories think about the good things in your life but just be here now because anxiety and worry resides in the future yeah guilt and resentment reside in the past in the past but be here now ask yourself questions you know like some of the things that that i do when i start to become anxious or i start to get triggered about things that happened in the past just ask myself so that's it. are you safe yes do you have food on your table yes do you have people in your life that love you yes and gratitude. Just be grateful about the moment. Let the person who's with you be the most important person in the world while they're with you. Yeah. You know? Of so. course. It's the simple things in life sometimes. Like you said, be grateful. Gratitude. Is People, it's, it's so easy to think of the bad things. Sure. Sometimes it's harder to think of the more positive things in your life. Without a doubt. Especially if you take them for granted. Right, because it's just your day to day. You're not really thinking about it. So mindfulness. Stop. 
think and really be grateful and awareness. it could go a long way. Yeah. Awareness. No yes. doubt. No doubt. Um, yeah. I would recommend to anybody if they ever get a chance just to just to write out a list of the things that you're grateful for. It sounds trivial and stupid, but I'm talking dig. Don't just talk. To, everyone does the same thing. What are you grateful for? My family, right? Yeah. My job. No. Like really, really. Like a really good tailor cup of to coffee, you. Right? Yeah. Um, a Sunday afternoon having a picnic with your family, or you know, get specific, but dial it down to the smallest details, and write that list out, and write it until you can't think of another thing in your life that you're that you're gra- grateful for. Gratitude, grateful for. Yeah. And once you do that, then go back through that list and ask yourself, how many of those things that you love are you doing every day? Right? Because How forget, much time? Yeah, how much forget, are you investing on those things? We forget to do the simplest things in the world that are the things that matter most to us. So you go back. Like, what did you do when you were a kid that made you happy that you could still do now? And why aren't you doing it? Mm-hmm. Be mindful of the fact that you still can. Yeah. It's important. It is very important. So you were able to overcome a lot. Sure. You changed careers. Yes. You not are still... <laughs> not as a choice of my own. Well, yeah. well you when know... I came back, When I came back, to, to make a long story short, the village did not give me the opportunity to return. Okay. So I had to resign. And I was unemployed for a few months. Um, I settled my court, court case. Uh, that took care of that. I got supervision for a year. Um, actually, I made restitution, which makes me very happy. To those of you out there, if I popped your tires, I'm really sorry. Um, but I did pay back, and I felt terrible about it, and I prayed for you guys, and, and I'm really sorry I did it. Um, to the officer who had to arrest me, um, we, he and I have spoken a couple of times since it happened. Oh, really? And I sent him an email when I got this job and said, listen, this is what I'm doing now, and I wanted to, number one, I wanted to apologize to you for what I put you through. It was not your fault, because cops haven't arrested cops. The worst, it's the worst pain you'll ever have as a police officer. Well, maybe not the worst, but it's one of them when it comes yes. to making arrest. But I, um, I sent him an email basically telling him I'm, I'm, I'm working in outreach in this program, this first responder treatment program, and um, I'm helping other officers who went through stuff that I went through with alcohol, substance abuse, mental health stuff. And I said, I just wanted to apologize, but I wanted to thank you for saving my life. And that officer, officer called me back. <laughs> He's like, oh, Billy, this is Officer X. Um, I'm not sure if you remember me. Yeah, well, he, knew, he knew me. He said, thank you so much for that. I said, listen, dude, I said, you did nothing wrong. Um, I am 100%, and I'm going to stress this, 100% responsible. Do not play the blame game. Do not make excuses. No matter where you are in your life, you're there because you made the decisions that got you there. You have to take responsibility. If you don't. You can't fix your problems. If I yeah. blame you for my problems, then it's up to you to fix them. If I assume the responsibility for those problems, I can fix them myself. Yeah. So if you blame other people, there's just no growing either. Yeah. You're, You're just, giving them the power to fix your life. Yeah. Why? Take the responsibility, the good and the bad. Take the, you celebrate your victories for the hard work you put in to get where you're at. But yes, I did. A heck of a long road. Three months of unemployment. Eighteen. When I when I went to I went to work at a treatment center after I lost my career. I, about a couple of months later, I went to work as a behavioral tech okay. at a place in in the suburbs outside of Chicago with a bunch of amazing people. And I mean that on both sides: the people I worked with and the clients who came through the door. But the irony of it all was that I I walked into this facility and the clientele was probably about 90% detainees, jail transfers, and drug court appointed clients. So I went from putting people in jail to trying to help save their lives. Oh. And so I started out as a tech, and I don't know if you know what a behavioral tech does in a treatment facility, but you know, we basically run the day-to-day operations. We you know, provide the shampoos, the soaps, the pillows. When we have new admissions, we do, you know, urine drops. We do, t- you know, random urine drops and testing, or we do admission uh, urine drops. Uh, go through property, screen property, search rooms, oh. guide them, take them to breakfast, take them to lunch, wake them up in the morning, put them to bed at night. I mean, it's, you run the floor. And you did that for how long? 18 months. I took an approximate $95,000 pay cut. Without exaggeration. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, my police salary is public record, so if you want to look it up. <laughs> but I was I was averaging about one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and I went to making uh, about twenty nine thousand, thirty thousand a year as a tech. Um, financially challenging, but what ended up happening was, is is being around the people who were addicted and learning and hearing their stories, just inspired me more to want to help people 
I just wanted to help people and give people an out because even though I was only coming around the road with with my own recovery, Mm -hmm. I literally, two years I haven't even been tempted to drink. Like I don't even think about it anymore. I so be you've been sober two years and three two months years. In, a, in, a, in a scratch a few days. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's been a, yeah, but honestly, Congrats. it feels like I've never had a drink in my life. I don't think about it. I don't need it, and I've been through. I mean, believe me, I've been through. I can't even discuss some of the personal stuff I've been through after the fact. If I didn't drink then, I'll never drink again. I know that, and the the, the recovery world's gonna be mad at me for saying it, but I I I play mind games with myself. Okay. Um, I feel like I've worked really hard to increase my intelligence and to become more knowledgeable of what it takes to live a better life. And then just a small piece of my ego creeps in and say, I'm way too smart to put myself through that kind of hell again. Okay. I'm just not going to do it. I am not, there's enough suffering that happens, you know, that's out of our control. Why would anyone make a choice to self inflict harm on themselves? And that's, that's what it is. It's self inflicted suffering. Yeah. So um, my inspiration to stay sober, it's not even really, I don't, you know, it's, it's God gave me a second chance. And uh, I feel that once I gave my life to God, he started to guide me in the right directions. And he's, he's cr- given me so many more gifts in my life that I'd be spitting in his face if I ever broke, you know, broke my body yeah. to stay sober and, and to be true and honest. So. You were a, you were also able through treatment to, to get like a, a toolbox of, of things to sure, use. Sure. You, you mentioned to me before that you have triggers that now you can recognize. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's, I, I actually still have them. Um, one of the ones, I just had one recently. I was down at the, uh, at the ILETA conference in St. Louis. That's uh, Illinois, uh, or the International Law Enforcement and Educators Association. Or, sorry. Sorry, ILETA. <laughs> you can cut that one. <laughs> But uh, I was down at the Ayurveda conference in, in St. Louis, and I remember walking down the hallway, and a, and a housekeeping cart passed me, and I smelled like a cleaning solvent, mm-hmm. and instantly went back to the psych ward. Instantly. Like I was really? in it. Yes. The smell. Whatever cleanser they were using was something that was used at the psych ward, and it brought me back. And I was luckily, I was like three or four rooms away from where I was staying. I went to the room. I sat down. Got still. Started to breathe. Breathing is so underrated, right? I Our, know. It sounds basic, but it, it's everything. It's everything. And there's different techniques. There's different breathing sure. techniques, well, too. Well, I had learned a few. Um, I'm not an expert by any yeah. means, but uh, I was doing box breathing. Mm. It's like something that like the military snipers do before they take their shots is to you know, take a, a, a deep breath on a four count, hold for four, exhale on a four count, hold for four, and just repeat. And you'd be surprised. I like... I instantly felt better but then you just the right conversations uh there's a there's a great neuroscientist out there it's uh it's joe dispenza i don't know if you've ever heard of yes dispenza. i love dispenza. yes uh, fantastic joe if you're watching this call me yeah do call lunch. me we want you in the show i'll, buy, I'll, buy <laughs> I'll send great, you an email yes come I think to chicago I did already pizza. to be honest get your pizza. <laughs> but uh, i remember you know reading a couple of his books and watching a lot of his videos and he talks about how you know we on average we have 60 to 70 thousand thoughts per day right but because of who we are most of our thoughts unfortunately end up being negative it's it's having self conversation with yourself that's positive you have to train yourself to focus on the positive things and not have these negative conversations constantly it changes your whole mood yeah are we asking ourselves the right question? Because if we really think about it, when you have a thought, it's just a self-conversation. Like, what am I going to eat today? What are you talking to yourself? About? But that's the hardest thing sometimes. It sure it is. Being able to, it's always easier to talk to somebody else and give them good advice or good positive reinforcement or just be nice. But then right. when it comes to yourself, it's just, so, it's harder. It is. It's harder. It and you don't think a, it's about a habit. it. It's a habit like anything yeah. else. The more you continue to do something, the more it becomes ingrained in your routine. Exactly. Um, the easier it becomes. So, you know, I remember watching like Tony Robbins stuff where Tony Robbins is talking about how he's screaming, he's invincible while he's riding his bicycle and stuff. I was doing that stuff. Yeah. I was insane. Riding down the street, yeah, I'm invincible. You know, as I after <laughs> right after I got my driver's license suspended and I was forced to ride a bike to Walmart, you know. I was that guy, you know? Yeah. I used to be a cop. <laughs> that was better than saying all that. <laughs> right. Me, me and my buddies, we used to be driving down the street in a squat car. We'd sit in car to car and we'd see a, you know, a middle-aged guy right by on a bike with three bags of groceries. Like, yeah, he's, his license is suspended. 
you know, making a joke about it. And then I'm riding the bike down the street with the groceries going, I'm that guy. I'm suspended license guy. So, oh uh, yeah, legit. I mean, I'm not yeah. even exaggerating, you know. It, it just is what you it is. You never know. You never know. You know. You never know. But, uh, but yeah, uh, what appears to be rock bottom can sometimes be divine intervention. Um, uh, faith is everything to me. It is everything that brought me back to reality. And, you know, um, my faith in God, my faith in 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 spirituality is is so strong because of what I've experienced. I've experienced absolute miracles. That'd be a whole other podcast. You need to have time for that. Like legitimately I have a book yeah. of miracles that I write where things that have happened, there's just no other explanation than a, than a divine intervention. No, no explanation whatsoever. Wow. What a great so, story. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> um, for anyone that is listening to us, that is relating to you, that might be considering seeking therapy or might start recognizing PTSD or PTSI symptoms, symptoms. what would you say to them? Do not hesitate to get help for stupid reasons. Um, we, can't, we can't have tombstone courage. In, in this world with first responders. There's an estimated like 30% of first responders are suffering from cumulative PTS. I, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about it as I go forward, but um, you have to be aware of the signs. You have to pay attention to your body. You have to pay attention to people who love you, that are gonna be honest with you and tell you like your mm -hmm. attitude sucks. You know, you're cranky all the time. You never sleep. You're eating garbage. You never get any exercise. You never do anything you used to love to do. Why are you always raising your voice at the family, treating us all like perpetrators? Whatever the case is, you have to be aware of the signs. You have to sit still and you have to think to yourself on whether or not you can handle what you're going through or you need someone that can give you the tools to get through it. Because honestly, there's... You know, tombstone courage only leads to, to one thing. It leads to either death of your life or death of your career, period. Uh, if you've got PTSD, if you're suffering from the effects of post-traumatic stress and you're starting to feel irritable all the time and you're not mm -hmm. sleeping and you're having nightmares or you're having panic attacks, that stuff's not going to go away if, unless you address it, unless yeah. you go to somebody who can give you the tools to fix it. Yeah. So, yeah, don't don't hesitate. Forget, drop the bravado crap. Yeah, you're a hero. It's true. You are a hero, right? But, but heroes um, also need their own heroes. Everyone does. Yeah. You know, we're 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 you're a member. Even as a, whether you're a police officer, military, firefighter, nurse, whatever, you're you're all part of a team. Let the mental health professionals be part of your team. Right. You know, just extend the family. Right. We let you do your job. Yes. Let us in and let us do our job. We, you know, as a police officer, we answer the calls. For mm -hmm. everyone, there's people out there to answer the calls for you. Mm -hmm. Place the call. Don't yeah. be foolish. You get one life. You get one opportunity, as far as we know. You know, reincarnation, we can argue <laughs> that too. But no, the reality That's is. That's another podcast. Oh, yes, yes. Along with the other miracle podcasts. But, exactly. I'm sorry. Was I slouching? I'm sinking in this chair. <laughs> but, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Then we're gonna have a religious. Yeah, then we're gonna have a religious podcast next yeah. time. Yes, yes. The spirituality <laughs> no, that's definitely podcast. not my forte. But uh, there's. But there's... hey, spirituality. If it helps you, right? We all have to believe in something, and sure. I think faith is a big part of of what helped you, no and it's doubt. also part of the AA, correct? Sure, sure. So Twelve steps, you know. It serves um, you. Accepting a higher power that that mm -hmm. there there's something bigger than us out there, you know. I I. I when I was working as behavioral tech uh, at the other facility I was telling you about, uh, I started out just as a tech and then kind of became almost a, a group facilitator. So I started off doing one group after we had some staffing shortages with COVID and I did a couple of health and wellness groups and then it was pretty well received, not just by the, the clients, but some of the staff thought I was doing a pretty good job. So they asked me, well, can you do another group? So by the time I left, I was actually doing four groups a week. So it became a whole, a whole thing. But I, I used to have people that were extremely reluctant to believe in something bigger than themselves. Like really? reluctant to believe in a God or anything higher. Anything. Because they've been through hell. How could mm -hmm. how could a God be out there that loves yeah. us so much and we suffer so great? Not realizing that it was their decisions that put them there because they weren't at that point where they were ex assuming responsibility for their actions. 
But here's what I told them. I said, listen, I said, you, faith is a choice. Believe it or not, it is. It's a choice. Because obviously when you have faith, you're believing something you've never seen. But have you never seen it? Look around you. You know, an acorn turns into a tree. You know, yeah. a seed turns into a plant that bears fruit. My, I, put, I would put it to them this way, in, in terms they could understand. So listen, you can, you have two choices. You can believe in, or not two, but maybe more. You can believe in nothing and believe that this is the only life you'll ever have, that there's no spirit, there's nothing fancy, and you're going to die, you're going to rot, you're going to be a part of the ground. You can believe in that, that there's nothing after this. Or you can believe in an all-powerful creator of the universe who loves you. Yeah. Whatever you want to call that it. Walks, that <laughs> walks by your side and is with you everywhere. And then you'll return to him one day when you leave this world as a spirit. You'll return to your source. Which one do you think is going to have a better... You know, a better outcome. outcome. Yeah, um, that that alone. You know, I've gotten to the point now where I'm. I I I feel as if with the miracles I've experienced in my life, that as I have shifted from belief to knowing, because there is a difference. Like I, oh yeah, I believe in God. No, I know He's there. I know He's there because I never would have made it where I am now without Him. Never in my life. And I love what I'm doing now. I get to help people. I get to. I get to steer first responders in the right direction. I do a lot of public speaking. I get in front of these guys. I tell them my story. Um, you know, give them the gritty yeah. details. And I basically look them in the face and say, listen, don't suffer unnecessarily. Let my suffering be the example. Don't be like me that failed to get help and lost his career. Be like me who got help, got the tools, learned how to do things the right way, and, and got through this mess. Do it now before you lose your career. Or even your life. Worse yet, even your life. Yeah. So... No, what you're doing is wonderful, and the job that you have right now, I'm sure it's very rewarding, yes. and you're still helping people, which is the main reason why you started. Absolutely. It's my, being, it's my driving yeah. force. It's my driving force. What's the cliche? You know, if you do something you love, uh, you never work another day in your life, mm -hmm. right? This, the aspect of, of providing a resource for people to get help, especially, you know, first responders, cops, uh, you know, drives us. Those of us who understand the law enforcement world, it drives us bonkers when we hear, you know, like defund the police. Uh, you know, no, police reform is necessary. It is, but not the way people think. Don't defund. Fund the police with the proper mental health care mm -hmm. and, and, and the pay attention to what they're going through. Because most first responders will see, uh, they'll see in a day, they'll see more traumatic incidents than most people see in a lifetime. Most other people see traumatic incidents on accident. Like they're walking by and some guy jumps out of building. Yeah, whatever. randomly. Random. But for us, we are running into it. Whether it's a bad car accident, whether it's a suicide, a homicide, you know. Thankfully for me, I didn't have to witness like a lot of violent crime up front. I was never shot at. Well, as far as I know, I was one call. It was kind of iffy, but we weren't shot at, but we had shots fired over our heads from somebody who thought it was fun to shoot a rifle in his alley. Okay. But. <clears throat> But um, still, constant negativity. Nobody calls the police to invite you to a barbecue, <laughs> like right. So they they call you because they're having a horrible. Something's day. happening. Something's Crisis. Bad. Yeah. Crisis. Domestics. Fights. You know whatever the case is. You know or their home is burglar burglarized and you go in there and you realize that they lost their their mother's jewelry or you know something sentimental yeah. that can't be replaced it's not even about the money anymore it's about the invasion of the privacy and you you feel for these people like i said my parents house got broken into twice you know and we didn't have much of a middle class family you know yeah. we're not sitting on stacks of gold but they took everything that mattered to my family they took my my grandmother's jewelry and she had passed away in 1990 they took other things that were irreplaceable stuff that belonged to my mom when she was a kid yeah ripped up pictures from her family that couldn't be replaced i scanned them and tried to photoshop them but it's not the same it's not it's not the same so yeah I, 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 man i went off on a tangent there i don't remember what i was talking about <laughs> <laughs> well, it's we? okay we're well, talking we? about your projects where you are at now yeah. your career your job yes so, i know i know you are currently doing a documentary or you did a documentary i was a part of i was a part of what i believe is going to be an amazing film so what led to this is obviously the job i'm doing now so i'm an outreach uh, specialist for for haven for heroes which is a haven health management first responder treatment program we've got a detox center and an inpatient center out in florida uh one in west palm and one in, in delray beach where we have a first responder track for alcohol substance abuse and mental health so that's that's my bread and butter that's what i'm doing now it's my job to get the word out and let people know that there's something available for them 
where mm-hmm. people understand not only understand their culture but respect it tremendously and they're surrounded with first responders um you know pictures on the walls and 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 the atmosphere and the culture is geared towards them you know segregated living quarters for first responders uh we're making a, a true effort to provide yeah a haven yeah. for heroes right i love it and along with that through that program i was actually exposed and uh, was invited to participate in a documentary called residual and what it is is uh, doug haynes who is the director producer of the film um, wants to make a film about cumulative first responder trauma so not just the you know the one traumatic incident that creates all these problems and traumatic stress which we will not downplay that yeah but but that's less um less what's the word i'm looking for? less common less common thank you michelle <laughs> Less common than the cumulative, because yeah. thirty. They're estimating thirty percent of first responders are dealing with cumulative trauma. When you are repeatedly exposed to traumatic incidents and stress constantly, you you know you're filling up your your backpack with yeah. five pound rocks every time you're you know you, you go on a traumatic call. So um, the film focuses on not just police officers, but other all first responders and and some of the tra- trauma they dealt with on the job and how it affected them. And not only that, but how they've gotten through it and gotten better, you know, as a result of finding tools to work with it. So um, I know Doug, Doug is an amazing guy. Mm-hmm. He has a beautiful vision. There's, there's stuff out there. Residualfilm.com uh, is, is where you can see there's some preview videos out there. You get to take a look at my <laughs> ugly face out there with my shiny head. And uh, <clears throat> but, I want to uh, see it. I want to see it. I think it's great that everybody is talking more mental health, yes. trauma, for sure, first responders, just everything. I love mm-hmm. it. I love what everybody's putting well, out there. You know, you're going to find that it's, it's, a, it's a tragedy when an officer, a firefighter, even veteran, you know, has to be discharged from duty because they suffer from some type of mental illness or even, you know, alcohol or substance abuse that leads to, me- you know, or, yeah. or, or is self-medicating the problem. Um, it's hard to replace somebody who's got 10 years. On- like, I have 13 years on the job. You're going to replace somebody who's got 13 years of experience, 13 years of training, 13 years of intelligence from the street with somebody who who's new. Not mm-hmm. that they don't deserve a chance, but let me leave the job yeah. this time. Yeah. No, it makes sense. But eventually they'll get to where you are. Hopefully not make the mistakes Hopefully. you did. Well, that's Because that's you're out there that's telling your story. Yes. So I, that in itself is a great project. You know, every time, I, every time I tell a story, I relive it. Uh, every time. I relive it just a little bit. But then one of those tools I use is the shift, right? You just shift. Okay, you know why you're doing this. Mm-hmm. You're not doing... I, I don't do anything for Dog and Pony Show. Believe me, if I had it my way... I'd be in a cabin in the woods somewhere fishing. Now, I don't need yeah. attention. It's not about attention. I don't care about it. The only reason I want attention is to bring attention to the resources. The awareness. To, exactly. Yeah. To help my brothers and sisters in the first responder world and civilians alike, man. I want everyone to detach from the stigmas of getting help because there's resources out there and technology and, and, and intelligence. of and, and what's the word I'm looking for is the, uh, God, I'm drawing a blank. The treatment options, modalities. All of that is is getting better, yes. And they're discovering more and more with their with their um, with their research on how to combat and treat these issues. So uh, it's not 1985 NYPD Blue, Dennis Franz type stuff where you know where you can't go get help, toughen up, Buttercup, and all that other yeah. stuff. Like now, especially in this day and age, people are starting to understand mental health is a big deal in the first it's responder important. world. It's really important. And people are definitely more warming and welcome to people getting treatment, you know. And talking about it. People yes. don't knock you if you get help. Now you're kind of celebrated for it. You know, yeah. you're, you're you're deemed courageous just for reaching out for help. Yeah. So and that's a, due to the younger people, no, too. No doubt about it. Because yeah. now they're the ones coming out and talking about it and talking about meditation and holistic ways and then the medicines and, and all these different subjects. So... You know, I think in a couple of years, it's only going to get better. It is. And people are going to start to understand that mental health is health. Right. In general, the same way you go to a doctor, you go to a therapist. Right. You got a lot of old school um, veterans that are in leadership positions. Mm. And so they are of the old world mentality where they just don't want to talk about it. They don't. They know what it is. They don't want to address they, it. They've yeah. been through it themselves. They know 
but they don't want to draw any attention to it, you know, because it's they don't want to be they don't want anyone to be seen as a liability for their department. Um, it's not that they're that they're cold hearted, don't care. They're just not used to dealing with it. Twenty years ago, thirty years ago, nobody nobody talked about this stuff. Yeah, nobody. So, well, I'm glad we are now. Yes, and I'm glad personally. Me and you are talking about it Absolutely. and did talk about it. Very, very cool. <laughs> I yeah. want to say thank you. You're thank welcome. you for coming. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. I only wish you but the best. I and truly do appreciate I it. I can't wait to see your documentary. Yeah, it's, it's not all about me. Just, just, there's no, other people okay, in it. Okay, sorry. No, the documentary. It's, it's, the, the people that are all involved in it, um, a couple of them I know personally, um, but I've got a chance to watch this. Man, I'll tell you what. Um, it's Some of it is heart-wrenching to see some of the pain that people are in. But I applaud everybody. And Doug, Doug's doing a fantastic job. Doug wants to get this out because he wants people to be able to use it as a training tool to, yeah. to, to bring awareness to the problem. Because I love it. Not a lot of people know it. You know? Not a lot of people are aware of what, what first responders go through. Yeah. You know? Education and, is key. Yeah. And uh, educate people to, to our military and our emergency personnel and hospitals, our police, our firefighters, my brothers and sisters everywhere. I love every single one of you. I'm not going to stop fighting uh, to to, to provide the information and to, and to give you the inspiration to go and get the help so that you do not end up losing your career or even, God forbid, your life. Um, get help. It's never worth it. You get one life. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you everybody for tuning in. If you or anybody has ever suffered PTS or if you're a first responder, I would love to hear from you. Please comment below. Let me know what you think of this episode and don't forget to follow and subscribe. I'll see you next week.